Hi, I'm Mark Lux, Extension Weed Scientist for Ohio State. Um, if you watched the first video from this field, we were talking a little bit about pigweed variability and um, identification, and this is just the second part of that. We'll talk a little bit about management. In this field, you know, one of the questions we had, again, this is a field you know, that was cropped up until last year, had soybeans in it, um, and then this year they're trying to get a pollinator wildlife seeding go going in there. And there are patches um, in this field of uh, large patches where there's a lot of water hemp slash palmer or some hybrids and then there's large portions of this field where you just see a, an isolated plant here or there you don't really see any so you know we were trying to we're always trying to figure out in a situation like this out of curiosity as much as anything else where did it come from and of course the possibilities are it came in on the seed it was produced in places like Kansas or Texas and the catch-22 there is that that scheme could be screened for the noxious weeds in that states where it's produced and doesn't necessarily get screened for palmer and water hemp if they're not noxious weeds in that state. So keep in mind you can always have a seed lot tested by a higher department of agriculture. Um, right in this field, I think our conclusion was um, that that we what we probably had was in the beans. You know, in the past couple years there was maybe an individual plant. So some plants got brought in here on a combine or something like that. Um, and then you had a, a few more go to seed last year, like in, in a couple patches, you might have had a few plants. This is sort of like a big low area. So, you know, we're thinking probably what happened when you have a species that produces 500,000 to a million plus seeds, you know, it doesn't take a lot of seeds to infest, <coughs> you know, a small area. You come in here, you blow those through the combine, and then you've got all of a sudden an area that's, you know, 100 by 100 or something like that with a little bit of water movement. So I think that's our conclusion here. Um, the question last year was nobody really seemed to see you know, that there was water hemp or palmer in the field, but, you know, um, maybe they weren't very many, or maybe there was some giant ragweed mixed in with it, you know, or something like that. So in this situation where you're really out of chemical options, you got desirable grasses planted, desirable, um, you know, native species and things like that. So, you know, we tried to formulate a recommendation here, and obviously it's gonna be mowing. They don't wanna um, take out the stand, so uh, it's gonna be mowing. Um, and then the question is, how, how do we mow to do the best job at shutting down seed seed production. So it's been mowed once, believe it or not, or these plants would really be a lot larger. And they mowed it pretty high. Um, you know, their philosophy was let's, let's not force it to sprout, um, to branch out really low yet, which I, I think is a good philosophy. So they mowed it pretty high, and then they have the chance the rest of the season. You know, keeping in mind, you're trying to just shut down. Um, once you start to see flowering and start to see the development of seeds, you know, you still have a week or more until you have you know, mature seeds. So by the time you start to see inflorescence since the flower heads till you have mature seed, you got a couple weeks at least really to kind of deal with uh, what you want to do. So that's sort of your, at the end of all the, you know, whatever gets done here, kind of doing some scouting and, you know, whether that worked in the last chance to mow it. So I think the recommendation really here is, especially in the areas that are um, really heavily infested, um, you know, mow it, keep, keep mowing it as you need to, and mow it a little bit high off the ground. And then as soon as you start to see um, get towards the development of, of uh, seed heads because day length will trigger it to, to throw seed heads, throw flowers and then seed heads. Um, then you might want to say, okay, it's mid-August, it's the end of August, something like that. We're going to go low at that point and mow it off um, right. And if we get a little bit of sprouting, we're going to hit frost here pretty soon, so we shouldn't lot, see a lot of seed production. What we have seen if you mow early is, and you don't, um, it, mowing early will force it to branch. It will, you know, continue to branch and, and get big through the season, but it forces it to go low. So like in a silage cornfield, sometimes what you see is you go in and see plants that are about this tall with little prong seed heads on them. So I think that's an, an okay philosophy. And again, um, in this area, then um, maybe doing some walking around the edges of the big patches with a machete or something like that to kind of look for the isolated plants um, that might be going to seed. You know, keep in mind that both water, hemp, and palmer are on the noxious weed list. So if you're a grower or a municipality um, or whatever, entity you are, you do have a responsibility to keep them from going to seed regardless of how um, they first they first got in there. And uh, we have resources to help with identification. Um, if you are someone who has an infestation in the area um, that is not being dealt with, certainly feel free to contact your county educator or contact us directly and we can give you some help with uh, the specifics of the noxious weed law. We do have a noxious weed bulletin online on the OSU Ag uh, Law website.